Hello. Welcome to another series of uh, mini lectures that we have about veterinary disease conditions. This one's on hip dysplasia, or so-called hip dysplasia syndrome. In 1972, I ended up with a little doggy that was hip dysplasia free, or supposed to be, because it was OFA certified hip dysplasia free from its sire and dom. Eight months later, the dog developed full-blown hip dysplasia, which didn't make sense because I had gone out of my way to make sure the dog would not have hip dysplasia due to its OFA certification. Obviously, it's not a genetic disease. Hip dysplasia is thought to be a genetic disease, but actually, according to the OFA and also to other sources, hip dysplasia is described as a polygenetic autosomal recessive with incomplete penetrance, which means this. In 1973, I started teaching genetics at the 300 level at Washington State University and did so for six years. So this polygenetic autosomal recessive with incomplete penetrance means that the disease process can occur sometimes or all the time, partially or completely, or skip a generation, which, by the way, makes the geneticist always right. Hip dysplasia is not a genetic disease, but rather there is genetic predisposition to something that's causing the animal to acquire the hip dysplasia syndrome. The hip dysplasia syndrome is fraught with osteoarthritic changes that occur in the coxofemoral joint the hip joint, so to speak. And so because of that inflammation, we see over a period of time, usually two to five years, osteoarthritic changes. Now, my profession, the veterinary profession, has a tendency to believe that osteoarthritis occurs all by itself. But as we're taught throughout medical school, that osteoarthritis or any other phenomenon that occurs in the bone is basically a response to the function. Form follows function. The body is not going to develop an osteoarthritic change unless the function is compromised. So where is the function compromised, essentially. Well, we didn't know this. I dedicated, uh, after 1972, when I ended up with this dog with hip dysplasia that I, that I loved, we did all kinds of surgeries and therapies to the dog. The dog really never got significantly better, but she lived a uh, ripe old age, essentially, uh, with hip dysplasia. But I dedicated my uh, interest to the hip dysplasia syndrome, essentially. Became a veterinarian in 1979 and practiced successfully in a small animal practice treating hip dysplasia syndrome for the last 35 years. In 1982, essentially, I was um, a surgeon and a neurologist in Seattle, and I noticed that virtually all the dogs that came to me with hip dysplasia syndrome had a rather unique phenomenon of neurological reflex that we could elicit in the mid-thoracic area, which doesn't make any sense. So now if we look at these dogs, I'll bring this out here. If we look at this dog, and I'll take my hips and stick them over here, we found that when we took an instrument such as this adjusting device, which we'll talk about later, and we brought it down the back of the animal and, and put energy into the dorsal spinous process, once we got to an area in the mid-thoracics, we got nothing, 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 nothing. But when we got to an area T8, T9, and T10, it looked like this, boink, boink, boink. We ended up with these reflexes in these relatively young, normal dogs. They were showing no clinical signs, and we thought that that was just a weird response. We kept track of it in our medical records, and then two or so years or, later, or so later, these animals would come back with, with osteoarthritic changes in their hips, indicative of hip dysplasia. We'd x-ray them and diagnose them, and yeah. And after a period of about 17 or 18 of these animals, when we go back and look at their records, finding out they had T8, T9, T10 subluxations, we found out that they in fact had this condition unfortunately and there was had to be something involved with this particular part of the body that was in fact affecting the hips and this is a strange situation for the veterinary practitioner because the problem actually exists in the hip and the, the thing that made us crazy is that why would a condition that occur in the mid-thoracic area f affect the hips? Well, we found out later, later on what was going on. If you take and you palpate these animals extensively, you'll realize that their iliopsoas and ileus and psoas major muscle, which comes attaches here, runs underneath the ribs, and comes down there and it attaches to the anterior aspect of the femur right here and pulls the leg forward, essentially. It's how the hips are flexed. You have one, too, and that's how you flex your hips. These were always spasming in these young dogs, pulling the hip forward and up and out of the socket. If we look at this particular situation here, the iliopsoas comes down like this, it's spasming and pulls this femur forward and up and out of the socket. I'm going to zoom in a little closer so you can have a little bit better idea of what's going on in the live animal. So in the live dog, the iliopsoas muscle attaches here and moves down and attaches to this area here of the femur. Pulls the femur forward and basically flexes the leg. 
when there is an injury or an, an, a, what we call a spinal interference, also called a vertebral subluxation complex, occurring in a, T18, 9, and T10, it affects the nerves that basically feed this iliopsoas muscle and flexes the, the actual hip. A dog that can't, that is developing hip dysplasia, can't jump and also can't jump up on anything and can't run very well, and also can't walk very straight. The reason for that is these muscles are continually spasming. Now, we were able to feel these muscles in these animals spasming, whereas the muscles on top are nice and smushy. The iliopsoas and psoas major on both sides were very commonly hard. Very commonly, one will win over the other, so we'll have a knot on one side. Also, it is particularly painful. Now, this is what's important, too, because the range of motion is compromised, essentially, and will continue to muscle spasm until finally it goes into fibrous metaplasia, and essentially we end up with a muscle that essentially is more calcified than it's able to function, and then that hip is, is uh, chronically uh, compromised in its ability to function. When we look at this in the, other, in the dog, for instance, in the actual spinal cord here, what happens is there's continual motion in this direction, pulling the femur forward, and up and out of the socket, but when this dog in this direction, but when the dog's leg comes back down like this, it rolls that femur up and out of the socket. And as it continues to roll up and out of the socket back and forth, every time the dog's motion goes like this, it goes like this, back and forth, this, back and forth, wears down the acetabulum, produces osteoarthritic conditions that will then very often develop the dysplasia like syndrome also. It is thought that the hip dysplasia, arthritis, if you will, is very painful. It's not. What's painful is this stressing and, and partial dislocation, like this. Every time the dog's leg comes back, it partially dislocates. It puts stress on the joint capsule, also on the round ligament, which is incredibly painful, especially in the young growing dog, which is why the dog at eight or nine years, eight or nine months of age, very commonly is so painful that the, uh, that the client very commonly will take the dog to the vet and if they can't afford the surgery, which is a salvage operation, then the dog unfortunately gets put down. What is important to notice here is that this disease condition, although has a genetic predisposition to disease, is an acquired disease condition. And so these animals, particularly when they're young, anywhere from five months on, will acquire a neurological interference from romping and playing and rolling around. Their joints are not, are not uh, uh, fused yet, so the epiphyseal cartilages are able to be injured. You've seen a dog bend in two. They, can, they don't break, but they end up with microfracture at the cartilage bone contact of the spinal cord, and that ends up creating what we call a vertebral subluxation complex. And that neurological interference, now we're talking about a neurological interference, will actually produce that pathological reflexes that you can see extensively when we, in fact, show you this particular technique on the vomtech.com website. We'll show you what these reflexes look like. Quite frankly, we go through a series of motions down, and the animal goes nothing, 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 and boink, 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 occurs at T8, T9, and T10. Either one of those places or all three. Every dog that is developing hip dysplasia will do that. Every dog that has hip dysplasia will do that. Every dog developing hip dysplasia has uh, spasms of the iliopsoas muscle, usually on both sides, essentially pulling their femur forward and up and out of the socket, and they grind their hips to pieces. Now, some giant breeds like the Great Dane really don't develop hip dysplasia, and they should because this is a disease process unique for giant breeds, but a super giant breed like the Great Dane doesn't end up with a problem in this mid-thoracic area. Their problem occurs up higher or down lower, just unique for that particular breed. So there's breed predilection to this disease condition. One of the ways that we have uh, uh, selectively bred our German Shepherds is to make them look really cool, and that has predisposed them to have this problem in their mid-thoracic area. Notice that the German Shepherds from Germany don't have that problem because their back are not roached, they're actually straight essentially. So we've kind of created this problem, unfortunately. It is a problem that we have successfully treated. Now, I personally have treated over 8,300 graduate doctors in the, in the use of this technology. However, the veterinarians, about 4,000 of which that I've trained, are, are kind of have two strikes against them because in the field it is thought that A, this is a genetic disease. It is not a genetic disease. It's a genetic predisposed disease and it is an acquired condition from something that occurs that my profession doesn't even recognize exists. And it is, in fact, by the way, the hallmark and the nidus of virtually all things that work in chiropractic care. So quite frankly, what we're able to do with this instrument, which we can't do in people, is we can find these reflexes and validate that we have, in fact, an active neurological interference occurring at this particular location of the spinal cord. 
And not only that, we use this device to treat it too. If you have any interest in this, you should go to the vomtech.com website, vomtech.com website, and you can see and actually download um, uh, videos on how the technique is done, why we do it, how to do it, and how we treat virtually hundreds of other disease conditions as diagnostically and therapeutically with this instrument. Your question, if my dog is developing hip dysplasia, can I reverse it? The answer is yes. If your dog's had hip dysplasia for seven years, probably not. Very commonly, these animals are found at eight to nine months of age, and we basically, instead of going to surgery at that point, we go through about six weeks of adjusting, and then if they're clinically normal, we leave them alone and they live happily ever after. However, that's the time if we're going to do surgery, we have to start that surgery at about eight or nine months of age, so we can do one hip and do the other hip uh, before they get to be 24 months of age. So it's imperative to understand that this condition is an acquired disease process. It's acquired from injury in the mid-thoracic area, which makes no sense until you look at the neurophysiology of the situation. We found this by mistake because we started evaluating a bunch of young dogs essentially in 1982 and we found they had this weird subluxation pattern. And then if we didn't treat that pattern, they went on to develop dysplasia-like syndrome. So we have virtually hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of case studies uh, that we have uh, done before we started delivering this technique, and now we deliver this technique throughout the world. Hip dysplasia, not a genetic disease, it's a syndrome. It is an acquired condition that occurs because of gene predisposition, the way that this dog is genetically manufactured, if you'll pardon that expression, has predisposed them to acquire this neurological interference, just being on the planet and roughhousing essentially, and that has produced the hip dysplasia-like uh, phenomenon. Again, I would invite you to go to the vomtech.com website and, uh, and uh, scroll down to the bottom of the index page and you'll see that you can actually um, uh, look at a whole series of videos that shows you how to do it, why it works, how to apply it in your practice, and also an invitation to take the whole course, which is huge. There are virtually seven or 800 different disease conditions that we diagnose and treat with this small piece of equipment, essentially. So I thank you for your patience today, and I would encourage you to go to the vomtech.com website and check it out and see if it's something that you could add to your practice. Virtually anybody can do this. I can teach a 13-year-old how to use this tool for diagnosis and therapy. So it's something that's very productive. Well, as I mentioned to you, there are over 4,000 veterinarians in the United States that I've trained to use this tool, and they're using it right now. There are over 5,000 chiropractors in the United States that I've trained to use this tool. It's a chiropractic instrument um, that I've trained to use this tool, and they're using it right now. So thank you for your attention, and have a great day.